Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our 5 Minute Histories videos and today we're going to talk about the building behind me, the Brinks Building. I'm down here on Holiday Street right around the corner from City Hall and next to the Peel Museum if you know where that is. It is hard to guess wrong on what this building is by looking at it. It looks like a little fortress. It's got a gun turret on the front and it's got the company's name blazoned across the front, Brinks Incorporated, the security company. It's almost as if they were tempting somebody to rob them, which I don't think anybody ever did. So how did we get this building built in 1948? How do we get this uh, down here in the heart of downtown? Well, let's talk about Brinks the company first and then we're gonna talk about the building. Brinks was started in 1859 in Chicago as a competitor to two older money-moving companies, American Express. American Express got started in 1850 in Buffalo, New York, with a couple of investors, including a, a gentleman <clears throat> excuse me, named Henry uh, Wells and John Fargo. Henry Wells and John Fargo, among others. And if you're thinking, wait a minute, I thought we were talking about American Express. Well, we are. Wells and Fargo in 1852 wanted to get American Express branched out to the West Coast in California. But a third investor, John Butterfield, didn't want to do that. So Wells and Fargo said, all right, John, we'll keep our American Express deal going here on the East Coast, but we're going to also start another company out on the West Coast. And that they did, of course, Wells Fargo. But because this is an interesting story, Butterfield saw the light, apparently, and started his own West Coast company, the Butterfield Overland Express, which at the time had the longest line of stagecoaches in the world. It was a stagecoach company. And it did well until 1867 when the cost became Came too much. And guess who bought the company in 1867? Wells Fargo. They scraped off the name Butterfield and put their own on there. And that's how we get the iconic Wells Fargo red stagecoach uh, icon that we've got today. All right, but we're talking about Brinks, not Wells Fargo. Um, so Brinks uh, started again in Chicago and it moved pretty much everything at the start. If you moved in from Cleveland to Chicago, it would move your luggage for you, for example. But by about 1900, it started specializing in moving money and other valuables. Um, uh, by, and by about 1920, it also started to branch out. It, Cleveland was its first branch. By the end of the 20s, it had 48 branches in the United States and two in Canada, so really quickly expanded. Here in Baltimore, uh, it came to Baltimore in the 1920s as well. We were branch number 20. And at first, it located on Redwood Street. Um, and that was a good location for it because it, uh, because it was next to City Hall. And uh, Brinks was a or City Hall was a client of Brinks. It moved uh, the city's money around. It also, by the way, collected the change that went into parking meters for the city. I guess every nickel counts. But it also, Brinks also had a number of banking clients. And Redwood Street was called the Wall Street of the South. And the building it was in, the Totman Building, um, was our stock exchange. Um, so that was a good location. But by 1948, it had moved here. Um, over the years, Brinks moved a lot of money, but it also moved some uh, other interesting things. In the Great Depression, it moved the majority of money in the United States around to keep us afloat. Um, at the end of Prohibition, it moved kegs of beer uh, securely uh, to keep them from thirsty crowds, I guess, until the appropriate time. Um, uh, and then at, for, at one point, it moved the Magna Carta. I'm not exactly sure when that happened, but it did. Um, all right, so 1948, uh, Brinks built this building. It was designed by the preeminent bank architects at the time, um, a firm out of Cleveland called Walker and Weeks. Um, they specialized in banks, but they also did the Cleveland Public Library, if you know uh, Cleveland at all. Um, and here, they pretty much copied the same design they had built for the Brinks office in Cleveland, um, but ours is a little bit smaller. But even though it's smaller, Brinks bragged about it. They said, quote, it had all of the latest safety devices to guard against robbery. And uh, I think those safety devices were put there for good reason. In 1950, the Brinks office in Boston um, got robbed, a heist of $1.5 million, the largest uh, to that date uh, in the country. So it was not taking any chances. Here we have this fortress. We've got a gun turret uh, with three portals, so uh, somebody could fire their gun three different directions overlooking the truck bay. It was a armed on every door. And Brinks also said it had a number of other security devices that it wasn't going to reveal to the public. So we kind of don't know what that is. All right, I'm going to wrap up with a word about its design. It's the architecture style is art modern. 
And you can tell that by the horizontal band of windows in the front. It's relatively small size, it's flat roof, and it's uh, ornamentation, which was called streamlined. So sort of think uh, Art Deco, but a little bit later. Um, so, uh, so come on downtown next time you're at the Sunday Farmer's Market, or maybe you're paying a parking fine because you didn't put your nickels in the, uh, the meters, uh, and take a look at this crazy little Art Modern fortress that we have next to City Hall. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.